want to start out with this picture here. You know, this is a nice looking picture. And by no means, even though I'm a turf grass scientist, uh, do I implore anyone to have a 100% turf grass landscape. I like all these flowers and some of these bedding plants and these trees and shrubs and stuff. Uh, I'm not here to tell you that, you know, uh, you need to have grass all around. But this grass does provide a nice contrast to all those colors in the background. And, and there's a lot of other benefits that turf grasses provide. And we would love to have a lawn that looks like this. I mean, we would all love our lawn to look just nice and everything. But far too often is the case, this is our reality, especially in the summertime, uh, when it gets to be really hot outside. Is this mic working okay? Okay. Okay. Uh, and, and so, you know, when we see this, and instead, of, instead of that, and we see this, we start to panic. We start to think, oh, I need to get my hose out, or I need to turn my irrigation system on. Uh, and that may be true, or there may be something else going on. You notice there's some shade in this picture. Um, there's kind of some green spots and some brown spots, or a lot of brown. And so there may be a number of other things that may just not be water. But there's a lot of different benefits that we need to first think about uh, before we start turning on, the turning on the water or trying to figure out if I should keep my turf or just some other things. And these are by no means an entire list, a comprehensive list, but we kind of break down benefits of turf grasses into three general or main categories, environmental or functional, kind of what Nick was just showing in that, uh, in that picture before, uh, in that backyard with the fine fescues. Uh, there's a lot of just different things that turf grasses provide that other uh, landscape plants themselves cannot provide, not just impervious surfaces like a sidewalk or a driveway, but also those trees and those shrubs or those garden and bedding plants uh, do not offer these same uh, measured and researched benefits uh, that come from managed turf. Recreational, of course, you would never let your children or grandchildren uh, have a backyard football game in your bedding plants or in your garden, but they're free to do that on the lawn. It's a low cost, safe uh, surface. Um, you know, it's a great area to have backyard uh, barbecues or patio parties or stuff like that. And then just aesthetic values as a whole. There's been a number of studies looking at uh, lawns and the impact they have on the property value of a home. Um, there's been studies, believe it or not, looking at green spaces in uh, urban environments and in commercial properties and big businesses where people work or schools. And they've recognized and, and measured that people have a better attitude, people have improved mental health uh, in these areas. So there's all types of benefits uh, from lawns and from turf grasses themselves. <clears throat> so why, why is water conservation important though? You know, we have all these benefits, but why is it important that we serve, that we save water? Uh, and I think obviously this is kind of a rhetorical question. We all know these are, you know, again, not a comprehens comprehensive list, but these are some, you know, general areas or important areas that we need to consider when, before we decide to turn on our irrigation system or pull out the hose and water the lawn. Uh, of course, being environmentally sustainable. Uh, these are, that's a big word nowadays, the past, you know, five years or so. Sustainability, not just in lawns, but also indoor water use as well. Uh, resource competition, you know, there's many other places outside of your lawn that uses water here in Vadna Heights. A lot of industries and commercial properties, uh, agriculture uses, um, residential uses indoors, and so forth. There's a decrease in supply. Uh, I just moved here a year ago, uh, two days ago. I've been here for a year and two days, and I can even see in my little neighborhood uh, where I live down in Como, uh, just the, the amount of people that have moved in there. Uh, and with that increase in urbanization, um, there comes an increased demand for water, for drinking water. Uh, utility costs, of course, is a, you know, right off the top of our head. We save water, we save money. But then one thing we may not think about is also plant health as well. There are a lot more severe consequences to overwatering than underwatering. If you let your lawn uh, have some drought and go a little brown, you know, it'll bounce back. And I got some nice photos to kind of demonstrate that uh, later on tonight. But if you overwater or frequently water, and you keep that, uh, you know, root zone saturated or just so much water logged in the turf. Uh, we saw that photo earlier from Nick about uh, just keeping that, once that soil gets saturated, it just leads to all types of uh, surface runoff. Uh, and also depletes the root zone of oxygen, which, which also is a negative impact of the turf grass plant itself, of the lawn. And so 
with all those things in mind, with keeping a nice healthy lawn, having all those benefits, but also trying to save water, you know, there has become an increased scrutiny towards the use of managed turf in the landscape. Uh, this is a headline from a couple years ago. This is a guy in southwest Minneapolis. I don't know who he is, but uh, he was featured in the Star Tribune in an article there, kind of widely circulated mm -hmm. that summer. Uh, and he tore out all his turf grass and he put in artificial turf. He put in some plastic grass. Now, now kudos to him for going to all that work and everything. But uh, one thing that he may not have recognized was all those benefits we talked about earlier. Uh, one thing that's not often you know, spoken of uh, by the plastic grass installers and by those who utilize this, that there are a lot more, uh, our surface temperatures actually increase uh, rapidly with uh, synthetic or artificial surfaces. And so it may be nice there on that cloudy day out on his lawn, but if it's a nice sunny day like this, uh, you're, he's probably going to go back inside after about an hour because uh, you can get temperatures just about as hot as it is on concrete. Of course, you also have to think about if there are any weed seeds that germinate in that, um, or if, let's say, the dog has to use the restroom. Uh, you probably don't want it to do that um, outside on the plastic grass. So that's not really an option, even though many folks may consider it. Uh, I would strongly discourage you not to. That's not the answer to water conservation. Even though you wouldn't have to water it, uh, there's a lot more negative impacts that come from there. But people think that, you know, natural grass or managed lawns, you know, it's their fault. It's visible to the public. We can see an irrigation system running off into the street or running off from the lawn into the driveway or just running, you know, during a rainstorm. It's something visible. You know, I can't drive past your house while you're brushing your teeth or while you're washing the dishes and see how much water you're wasting. But I can drive past your house and see if it, your irrigation system's running in a rainstorm. And that brings all the scrutiny, all this negative criticism uh, towards turf grasses in the landscape, towards, towards the lawn. And that causes folks like this to get rid of it and put in, you know, a plastic grass lawn or even just get rid of those grasses entirely and put in uh, some landscape plants or just nothing at all, more impervious surface. But again, if we do that, we remove all those benefits that we just talked about, those environmental and social benefits. This is what we talked about here a second ago, you know, this increased scrutin this scrutiny. And this is probably no, you know, strange picture than any of us here. We've all seen this probably at one time or another. The picture on the left really cracks me up because I don't know why they have, you know, two irrigation heads in that narrow strip in the driveway, but uh, I don't know if maybe the driveway came after that was installed, but nevertheless, we see, you know, there's a number of things wrong with that photo, not only irrigating the rain, but just having, you know, too many heads in that area, watering that, watering that surface. And then also on the left or on the right there, that's a, uh, you know, big commercial property and we have irrigation going off in a rainstorm, in a rainfall event. Here we have, you know, it's not raining, but we have some other uh, criticisms and concerns of, of lawns and the landscape and irrigation usage. Uh, these are demonstrative of poor irrigation timing. Uh, this hasn't been audited at all recently, and we'll talk about auditing later on. But we see all this runoff into impervious surfaces, into the sidewalk, uh, into the road, going down. Nick talked about storm drains a minute ago. Uh, this is a this picture on the bottom right. It's actually at the University of Arkansas, where I just got my PhD at. And this is at one of the fraternity houses, and it waters up there, up, up on the hill, and it just comes right back down into the street uh, because they, have it, they don't have a proper uh, irrigation system. They maybe have their runtime too long, and it's not getting in the soil. There could be a number of issues going on with that. And so in order to correct all this, in order to decrease the scrutiny, you know, the answer isn't get rid of your lawn. The answer isn't put in plastic grass. It's just put in you know, low maintenance landscape plants. We want to retain those benefits that we talked about earlier. And so we need to use, utilize a comprehensive set of what we call best management practices, or BMPs. Um, and th kind of three categories that we can kind of talk about tonight is turf grass selection. You know, we need, we need to make sure that we utilize uh, drought tolerant or drought resistant turf grass species. Uh, we need to get away from using cheap seed mixes or products that are available in many uh, common big box stores and just need to be careful of what we plant in our lawn and make sure it's, it's pretty low maintenance and pretty drought tolerant. But then even with the turf grasses that we select, we need to make sure that we manage them properly as well. Uh, we need to make sure that we're mowing them at the right height. We need to make sure that we're mowing them, you know, when it's dry enough. We don't want to go out and mow 
right after a rainfall event and just spread you know, potential disease pathogen all around the lawn. Uh, fertilization is a big one. Fertilizing at the right time of year, especially here in Minnesota, you know, we really don't need to fertilize that much during the summertime. But, you know, any lawn care company, they're, they're and, you know, God bless them, but they're trying to make a buck off of all of us, and they're gladly, like, encourage you to fertilize your lawn in July when you probably ought not to do that. Um, you know, we would generally recommend, and we'll talk about this later on, about when it is best to fertilize. Uh, when it is best to utilize like a pesticide, like maybe we have some broadleaf weed killer. We just want to make sure we're doing all these things at the right timing. That'll discourage the need to run an irrigation system or apply any water. But then also if we have irrigation, uh, there's a lot of things in and of using a sprinkler system that we can use auditing or using new technologies and tools uh, to enhance our irrigation efficiency, to enhance our watering applications as well. One thing I want you to walk away with tonight, if you walk away with nothing else, is that there really is no silver bullet. It's not just as simple as just, you know, converting to low mow grasses or, or vine fescues. It's not just as simple as raising your mowing height, or if you have an irrigation system, um, just hooking up a sensor or changing out to a smart controller. You know, it's a whole host of things that, you know, all of these best management practices, one at a time, um, and building upon each of those. So how much... So how much water do turf grasses need? Um, you know, if I was to ask you that question, you know, your neighbor, you may say, well, my grass needs 10 minutes of water. And your neighbor may say, my grass needs 25 minutes of water. We never make recommendations based upon time uh, at turf grass sciences. Uh, we're always recommending the volume, and the way that we get there is, is based upon how much water has been lost uh, through the environment. And also, one thing to think about, too, is that water is going to require not only from the environmental conditions, but also by the turf grasses themselves. This goes back to what we just mentioned, the turf grass selection. There are turf grasses that are, you know, more adaptable to, to be utilized on golf courses. There are turf grasses that are more adaptable to be used in a lawn. Turf grass is more adaptable to be used in shaded environments. Um, and there, if you look at a golf course, if you go to a park, um, or if you go to a roadside, you'll notice that you'll find maybe three or four different grasses at each of those locations, or within those three locations themselves, you'll find uh, various types of grasses. They all have various shapes and sizes, colors, uh, leaf textures, just like you and I here in this room. You know, we all have, you know, we're all different heights, different weights, different skin tones. We all maybe have, you know, more hairs or wider arms or just, you know, whatever. We all have different characteristics as humans, and turf grasses themselves do as, as well. It's not just, you know, just a green plant. It, there are, there's many things, there's more to it than meets the eye. And so our, one, another thing to think about too is, are these problems that we talked about earlier, are these just aesthetic uh, issues, are these aesthetic issues due to drought, or are they due to maybe something else, like we talked about before, these best management practices? Did I over fertilize? Did I fertilize when I didn't need to? Or do I have compacted soil? Uh, am I mowing too low? Am I mowing at the wrong time? And so that's another thing to think about when we think about, you know, well, does the turf grass need water or do I need to adjust something else uh, in terms of my management practices? Turf grasses, and this is kind of, it may be a little bit hard to see where you're sitting, but up where we're at in Minnesota, there at the top, you know, we are in this cool, humid area, um, semi-cool, humid area. And these are, those are certain grasses that do well there in Minnesota, here in Minnesota, whereas all around the other parts of the country, and this is out of a turf grass science textbook, uh, there are other types of grasses that do well. And so, you know, if you ever have somebody that tells you to plant Bermuda grass up here, uh, they're pulling your leg. So uh, that's a warm season grass, and it will not do very well up here. And so that's just something that we need to recognize right away is what grasses are we utilizing in our lawn. Uh, for these areas. We kind of have Minnesota split in half in between the north and southern part of the state. Uh, but, you know, most of our cool season grasses, our fescues, our blue grasses, our rye grasses will, will do uh, better here than uh, many of the other grasses that you see listed on the screen here. And so what I mean by cool season grasses is that they grow uh, during this, they have this kind of life cycle or this growth habit uh, throughout the year. Whereas right now, during the springtime and these past few weeks or so, you know, they're just growing like crazy. You may see people mowing out there at least every week or a couple times a week because of how much rain we've gotten and how fast it's growing. 
But like I said, not fertilizing in July, you know, it's just trying to hang out. You're hot. It's hot outside in July and August. Guess what? It's hot outside for the grass, for the bluegrass, for the fescue uh, in July and August as well. We don't need to be, you know, basically we're shoving more vitamins down its throat, uh, getting it to try to grow more. When it's just trying to hang out and survive uh, in the summertime. And then in that fall, we can come back with the fall application of fertilizer, usually right around uh, Labor Day or so. And you can see, you know, that correlation between shoot growth and root growth. Again, not much going on. Uh, during the summertime. You know, we encourage folks to raise up their mowing heights during the summertime uh, and just kind of let it maximize its surface area and reach as much sunlight as it can and just kind of let it be, uh, let it hang out. And then, you know, that's the time that if we do need to turn on our irrigation system, I mean, that'd be the time to kind of turn, turn it on and maybe run it about once a week during that hot period. There are different cool season grasses, though, that have that life cycle. Uh, tall fescue is one that you may not have heard of. I did bring some with me. They're out there on the table. I'll be happy to talk to you about them. Um, we all know Kentucky bluegrass is widely utilized here uh, in Minnesota, mainly because it's also available as sod. It's a very quick, uh, easy sod uh, install type of, type of uh, planting method. Um, but tall fescue is very drought tolerant, very shade tolerant as well. Uh, I did bring a handout. I brought a couple handouts, one on irrigation and sprinkler system auditing, and then one on just different grasses that grow well or that perform well here in Minnesota. Uh, so a lot of more information about all these are on that handout uh, outside. Uh, perennial ryegrass, you'll see that in a lot of seed mixtures um, because it is a very quick germinating species. It'll germinate in about you know, three days, uh, sometimes even five days, and um, it pops up right away, but then it doesn't do very well in the heat um, or in the summertime after well. So just try to maybe stay away from, um, you know, heavy perennial ryegrass mixtures. A lot of our patch mixtures will have some ryegrass in them because the homeowner will buy it and they'll see the seed popping up and thinks it's working, but, you know, it may work for about a month or two, but then that, that grass will start to die out unless, we'll, unless we keep on top of it with the watering. And then fine fescues. Uh, fine fescues are part of our low input uh, grasses that we utilize a lot and that we talk about a lot at the U. These are very low maintenance. This is in that photo that uh, Nick showed earlier. Um, and we'll talk more about that. And that's outside on the table as well. Our fescues are very drought and very shade tolerant. Um, you know, those are really low maintenance options. Tall fescue is a really deep root system uh, to uh, basically soak up soil from deep in the profile. Um, those are really two options that we're trying to get folks to consider and get uh, away from bluegrass or basically have less bluegrass in their lawn. A little bit, little bit of bluegrass isn't bad at all. Uh, there are some, if you just have a really bad trouble spot, um, rough bluegrass or supine bluegrass uh, do really well in poorly poorly drained areas or really, you know, if you have a low-lying area of your property, uh, that would be an option uh, for that. Within these grasses, these are all species, and then within these species, you can select what we call turf-type uh, varieties and also look further for drought-type or drought-tolerant or improved uh, varieties or cultivars. Now, you, you may ask, how do I know which ones are turf-type or which ones are drought-tolerant? Uh, we'll talk about that here in a second, but we want to also consider, you know, how much water do, does my lawn require, you know, with all these different species that we've talked about uh, and, and looked at, you know, they're all cool season grasses, but they all have these different characteristics as well. Um, not only do the grasses themselves determine how much the water is required, but also the weather conditions as well. You know, it's, it's also determined on what you want your lawn to look like. You know, your performance and your quality expectations. You know, maybe you don't mind a little bit of brown, whereas maybe your neighbor wants it to look like the Minnesota Twins baseball field, just as green as can be. Um, but it's, again, kind of relative to this performance factor and not necessarily like in agriculture where we're trying to produce a yield or to produce some type of crop or, or like in consumer horticulture. But it's basically the water that's required to meet this performance expectation. It's that water that's required for plant growth, 
um, it includes water lost by transpiration and evaporation. Now, you may have all know about evaporation, that water, you know, evaporating, but transpiration is a really simple concept. Um, and it's, it's basically, you know, perspiration. I keep on saying, you know, grasses are just like you and me. Uh, you know, they have all these characteristics about them. They're all kind of different. Um, they're hot when it's, when it's hot outside. They're hot when we're it's hot outside. You and I are hot. Transpiration, if you think about it, is just like perspiration in humans. We sweat. We lose water through our bodies. It's a cooling mechanism. When we sweat, it cools our skin temperature. It cools us down. Plants do the same exact thing. Not just turf grasses, but uh, basically through these green leaves on these plants, and through turf grasses, you know, through that green leaf surface, it's losing water through its leaves through transpiration. So we're losing water through the soil, we're losing water through the leaves, and so all these environmental pressures, whether it's heat, humidity, wind, recent rainfall, um, will also affect how much water the lawns require. And so with that in mind, we need to think about choosing a drought tolerant or drought resistant uh, variety, a turf type variety. There's something called the National Turf Grass Evaluation Program, or NTEP. We have many NTEP trials at the University of Minnesota on campus, and many land-grant universities like Wisconsin, Michigan State, Iowa State, any basic land, any land-grant university that has a turf grass science program uh, will likely have some type of NTEP trial. Now, not all of them are for lawn grasses. Many of them are for golf courses or sports fields but we do have some that look at lawns. And you can go online to this website and then look at, you know, I want to look at the fine fescue uh, NTEP data. And I will warn you, this site is a little bit outdated in terms of the format with the organization. The, in the information's not outdated, just the way that we're getting around it. But uh, one of my colleagues at the university is actually working with some computer scientists to bring this up to date, and hopefully that'll be ready by the end of the year. Um, there are other websites as well that you can go to. Uh, the A-List, which stands for the Alliance for Low Input Tur and Sustainable Turf. Uh, the TWCA, which is the Turf Grass Water Conservation Alliance. Uh, these are two organizations that do a lot of research on grasses and then they'll list varieties or cultivars that are, you know, let's say, well, I wanna, you go outside this afternoon and you say, well, I really like that tall fescue. I wanna find me a, drought tolerant tall fescue that I could put in my lawn. Uh, you can go to one of these two websites or either both of them and look for the tall fescues on their website and then see where you can find the seed. It'll have the manufacturer or the, the company that develops that seed and you can look for that seed on that company's website. Uh, these are just research organizations. They're not the ones creating the seed, but they've done the research and the same thing with NTEP. NTEP doesn't produce any seed. Uh, we just do the research on them. These companies pay to have their uh, varieties tested. And one other one is low input turf. And this is kind of a work in progress, but this is kind of more up here in the north central region. It's right out here in Minnesota uh, looking at fine fescues and, and looking at low input turf grasses that don't need a lot of water, but also not a lot of fertility and not a lot of mowing. This is in South St. Paul at Lowe's. I, I'm not trying to steer you to Lowe's or a box store. I try to encourage people to go to more of like a, a Gertens or a Bachman's or a Ramey Turf. Uh, Twin City Seed Company are all excellent choices for lawns. We have information on our Turfgrass website. Uh, basically, there's a link that says seed purchasing resources, and it lists some good stores here in the area. But if you happen to be in a Lowe's or Home Depot and you pick up a product, a commercial product, uh, this is a Pennington product. It says Smart Seed there on the top. But if you look on the back of the product, you see that TWCA label. That means that there's grasses in that product, in that mixture, that blend, uh, that are qualified by the TWCA for having superior drought tolerance. So again, you have the science there right in your hand. Uh, that if you put out that product, you know, those varieties in that bag have, been dem have demonstrated to be drought tolerant through research, uh, through years of research. All right, that's kind of pointing where that, where that uh, label is, and that'd be on the back of the bag there. Now, not every product will have that, but you know, you will find it uh, on some occasions. <clears throat> so, we talked about, uh, you know, looking at drought-tolerant cultivars and drought-turf-type uh, cultivars. 
Uh, turf type basically means, I don't know if I said this earlier, you just basically don't want to buy a forage grass. You don't want to be plant something that's actually meant for livestock and not for pasture. Uh, generally, if you're you know, at one of these uh, kind of smaller areas or local you know, garden centers, you know, they're not going to steal you wrong and um, they'll, they'll get you a turf type uh, variety or species uh, that you want because they won't really keep those products side by side for one thing. Um, but also that, those environmental conditions. We touched on this just a second ago. Uh, we need to think about, um, I don't know why those showed up out of order, but we need to think about as well, always in the back of our mind, you know, water is continuously being lost. Today, we're going to have a lot of evapotranspiration, or evaporation and transpiration. So evapotranspiration is the combination of evaporation and transpiration. We, sometimes or you may hear, you know, if you're a weather nerd or get into a lot of meteorology, you may hear this term ET. That's not about that movie about the alien. It's talking about evaporation and a transpiration. And there's a lot of different environmental factors that influence it. Uh, temperature, sunlight, humidity, wind, and also recent rainfall will all influence the amount of ET. The higher the ET, the more water that's being lost uh, that needs to be replenished. And so what is it? How do I know what it is? This is it, right here. I don't know what it is, though. So it's a lot of math, and I'm not a mathematician. But luckily, they've written this you know, gigantic paper on it and done all the math for you. So there's other ways that we can figure it out without having to consult a mathematician. There are weather stations. Now, this is not a weather station that uh, any of you or neither myself would have in our homes. Um, you probably would not even have this in a, you know, a property here in Badness Heights. Uh, it's very expensive. This is a, a kind of more of a research station weather station or a university weather station. But there are now uh, personal weather stations. You could set this up in your backyard connected to your Wi-Fi in your home, and you could even be here in this nice air-conditioned building and look at the weather at your house on your cell phone or your mobile device or tablet. Uh, and it can also, you know, calculate that ET for you. And then you know, you know, how many inches and ETs typically quantified in inches or millimeters of water. And so you know how many inches of water to apply uh, based, on the, based off the ET, based upon how much water has been lost through evaporation and transpiration. That's just a, one of the latest prices. I'm, you may be able to get it for less than $170. But again, they're rather inexpensive, in my opinion, uh, for being able to get something like that uh, and set it up for under $200. Um, another way that we can also look at grasses, and, and I talked about the TWCA earlier, uh, this is one way that we utilize ET and drought tolerant varieties, or how we conduct these tests and utilize, you know, okay, we have this ET at this one location and we want to look at all these different varieties or species. Uh, we'll take pictures of them, these above ground pictures. This little blue box has a camera on the top of it, has some light bulbs underneath. So we have the same exact light source every picture we take of these different varieties of these species here on the ground. And then what happens is we can run them through uh, digital image analysis or just basically a simple photo analysis software program. And we're able to look at how much water or how much you know, green there is um, at that time. Uh, for example, I just kind of want to highlight the importance of utilizing a drought uh, resistant variety or cultivar, on the top, these are both Kentucky bluegrasses on the top and the bottom. And within each column on the top and bottom, uh, we replaced, you know, we added water at 48, 40, and 32 percent of water that was lost. So let's say, you know, we lost uh, two tenths of an inch of irrigation. Or, yeah, two, so 0.2 inches. Um, so if we added you know, 48% of that, that's roughly about, you know, a tenth of an inch of water that required. And then we can, you know, keep on doing the math later down the, the row there. But we can see, you know, big differences in the, the one of the picture all the way on the top right. Uh, when we, you know, not only are we utilizing lower amounts of water, but these grasses themselves uh, have different drought resistance characteristics. They're drought tolerant. And so that's just an example of utilizing uh, not only ET, but also uh, drought-tolerant species. And then also low-input turf. 
Uh, that's kind of another presentation for another day, but I just wanted to kind of show it here really quickly about utilizing fine fescues. And they talked about a program that you guys have uh, with switching out to low input grasses. And you can find more information on this website, lowinputturf.umn.edu, about kind of what you can expect to see uh, with low input grasses. And again, I brought one with me outside. This is on the campus, the St. Paul campus at the University of Minnesota. Uh, this is me standing on top of it. It just has, has this really nice meadowy look, pastoral look, kind of like what you see in those old timey paintings. Um, this hasn't been irrigated. It hadn't been mowed. This is last summer. Uh, around September, it's just kind of planted uh, back on this corridor between a couple buildings. It's kind of on a slope. Uh, it goes down those sidewalks and everything, and it looks as green as can be. It looks nice. And again, not mowed, not fertilized, not irrigated, just natural rainfall. And so again, uh, and I know there's been some other photos shared uh, throughout the presentation, uh, but this is again another photo of it on campus. This is at the Governor's Mansion down in St. Paul. We also utilize these not only for drought tolerance, but also for salt tolerance or, or roadside management from snow plows and um, salt trucks and stuff. And so this is another option if you live in a, in a neighborhood and you have a boulevard in front of your house uh, between the sidewalk and the actual road uh, would be an option to plant some fine fescues um, there, not only for the salt tolerance, but also for the, for the, for the drought tolerance as well. Um, I want to share some results. Nick asked me to share a case study with you, um, a couple of them. And so we're going to kind of skip through a lot of the words. So you can go back and look at the, the text on the online, on, camp, on, on, the, on the website. We basically took a bunch of different products and looked at, you know, just off the shelves and then planted them on campus. And we looked at them under two mowing heights. And we basically withheld irrigation for 60 days. And I'll show you how we did that. And then after the 60 days, uh, we ran irrigation for about a month, uh, and we only ran it two times, so about eight times it was irrigated in one month. So how did we do that? Well, we have something called a rain-out shelter, and this is the area where we planted the grasses, and whenever it would rain, the shelter would move over top of, this, over top of these plots in that yellow area, and that way... Uh, it wouldn't get any rain or any uh, wet or anything. We'd able to conduct that dry down. So you can see here in this photo, you can start to see some separation between each of those 29 products and how, you know, it helps us under, figure out, okay, is this product, does it have a lot of drought resistant or drought tolerant varieties? And again, we'll put that, we'll put that information out uh, on websites and we talk about it on our website and try to get people to, to find out, the re to hear about the results. Um, you can see some more variation. I like these pictures. You can see, again, just within, again, these are different products, and just looking at which one stayed greener or longer under that 60-day drought window. So some of the results, I know this may be a little bit hard to read, but we see on the top, starting in the top left, uh, we have a perennial ryegrass dominant mixture, and then going down below, we have one that's kind of a three-way with ryegrass, uh, some rough bluegrass, and alkali grass, which is a Salt tolerant grass found on a lot of mixture syrup in Minnesota uh, for roadside use. And then we have on the right side our two fescues, fine fescue at the top and tall fescue at the bottom. And what you can see is that within each of these, there's three, there's a set of six little pictures there. On the top is the, high, is the higher mowing height at three and a half inches. And on the bottom of each of those is the two inch mowing height. And we got about a week after the treatment was initiated, the dry down or the drought period, and then at the end of the drought period at 60 days, and then at the end, the 28 day uh, kind of final measurement uh, when we had resumed irrigation over those 28 day period. One thing we see is that at 28 days, all of these products seem to recover uh, or at least stay relatively green. So that's one thing to think about is with a lot of other plants, that we have in landscapes or even ground covers that when they're gone, they're gone. When it's drought and when their leaves are, are falling off the tree, when they're trying to save water as best they can, or their leaves are all curled up, you know, it's not coming back. Grasses will bounce back though, as evidenced here, and we have, a, have another photo to share with you all. Um, but even after, you know, 60 days of no water, and then, you know, 
about eight days of water over 28 days. You know, we see all of those bounce back. The other thing I want to point out, though, is with our fescues, that middle column on those pictures on the right, uh, both on the top and the bottom, you know, those are, those are still pretty green relative to the ryegrass uh, mixtures uh, on the left side, even after 60 days. Again, 60 days of no irrigation and no rain. Uh, they still have a really nice uh, green color to them. Um, maybe not as nice as seven days or 28 days, but they're definitely not as brown as the other uh, mixtures there on the left. So again, thinking about utilizing those, uh, you know, species instead of ryegrass or uh, just bluegrass only. Um, I, I just kind of talked everything that was on that slide, the results that were on, on that slide. Uh, another thing to think about, so we just talked about, you know, mowing height, increasing our mowing height, when to mow, uh, putting out our products, uh, fertility products at the right time. I get a lot of questions about aerification or cultivation, and then also pest management and product timing. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but if you go to the Extension website at extension.umn.edu backslash yard and garden, um, you can subscribe to the yard and garden newsletter through the Extension service. You don't have to, but we, send, we there is a weekly newsletter, I think, that comes out, or at least a monthly one. But you can also find information there just right on the fly about any of these types, types of uh, you know, practices, these cultural practices. For instance, mowing height. Uh, the higher you mow, the deeper the root system. That means more water can be uh, you know, obtained from deeper in the soil profile. Um, so we encourage folks to raise their mowing height you know, uh, during the summer. Bump it up to three or three and a half inches. Uh, the grass will love you for it. Um, fertility. You know, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but this is, again, very similar to that life cycle photo I showed a minute ago. Um, cool season grasses. It's growing a lot during the spring. So we want to get our fertility out. You know, you're kind of, uh, you know, almost done for fertility for this year. You still may be able to get away with it uh, for this spring. And then you, know, you just have to wait till the fall. Uh, but again, just, these are all recommendations off the Extension website. Uh, this is a table on the Extension website under the fertility section. It gives you every single scenario. Your mowing height, whether you bag the clippings or keep the clippings on the lawn. Um, whether you do have irrigation or, other, or don't have irrigation. So, and you can read that uh, on that website. Then cultivation and aerification, you know, pooling cores, improving our soil compaction, getting more oxygen and water into the root zone. The best time to do this is in the fall. You can contact your lawn care provider or a service contractor to see if they offer the service for you as part of their, uh, as part of, you know, their services. But this is basically what happens as a result of cultivation or aerification is we're pulling out you know, hard compacted soil and allowing more oxygen and water to get in, and it increases that rooting activity, again, allowing for more uptake of water and nutrients in the soil. Now, one thing I want to think about before we close tonight, I want you to think about is we have not at all talked about irrigation. We have not even talked about sprinkler systems yet. Everything we have talked about so far tonight are things you can do even if you do not have a sprinkler system at your home. These are all practices that you can do uh, using the right grasses, using you know, the proper mowing heights and all these cultural practices, whether you have a sprinkler system or not. So again, all of these things, there's no silver bullet. Uh, you know, there's many things that we've talked about, um, and you know, I wish we had time to talk about more, um, but things you can do, can do to reduce the need for water uh, in your in your lawn and in your in in your yard, but you may ask, well, I do have a sprinkler system, or how, or I do use an above ground kind of hose. How do I know when the ET's been high? How do I know I don't want to buy a weather station? How do I know when the moisture in the soil is low? Um, there's above ground symptoms such as wilting and, and firing of the leaf, uh, of the leaf surface or the leaf tissues or they turn brown or tan and they'll start to roll and fold. Uh, visible footprinting or tire tracks if you drive a small utility vehicle over the lawn, uh, maybe the lawn mower and you come out uh, later and the tire tracks are still pretty visible. Um, you can also do the old fashioned screwdriver test where you stick a screwdriver in and see if any soil sticks to it. And then also irrigation sensors and technologies, what we'll end with today. But again, uh, we have some leaf firing going on here, some wilting, uh, indication of drought stress, 
Uh, this is on a putting green on the left, but we were just pull out that leaf of that turf grass out of the out of the ground there. We can see you know the healthy leaf, and we can see the older leaves uh, starting to kind of wither and uh, reduce their surface area, reduce its chlorophyll production um, there because it's getting hot. Um, I talked about earlier footprinting. You know you can turn around you know after being outside, and if you come back you know an hour or two later, you still see your footprints after about maybe 30 minutes to an hour. Uh, it may be that time to irrigate. One thing to keep in mind before we talk about, you know, sensors or um, these newer technologies is understanding the sprinkler system itself. Uh, we have, you know, everybody has that has these sprinkler systems. They have some type of controller. Uh, maybe it's some type of dial. Maybe it has a bunch of buttons. Maybe it has no buttons at all. A lot of these controllers now uh, don't have any buttons. These smart controllers. Um, you can go online to irrigation.org backslash WSAT. That stands for Smart Water Application Technologies. You can learn more about smart controllers there more in depth than what we'll talk about tonight. Uh, pipes and valves, these all represent your zones, and um, these will be dependent on the number of zones in your system. So maybe you have an irrigation zone from the front yard, one for the back yard, one for the garden, uh, one for the landscape bed. So that's just going to depend on property to property. Uh, heads and nozzles is all different types. And within those, they all have different application efficiencies. This is another reason why uh, we make we never make time-based recommendations. I'm not going to tell Tyler to mow his to irrigate his property for 30 minutes and tell Nick to irrigate his property uh, for you know 10 minutes. You know, it's all going to be different uh, depending on their system and depending on all these different things. Uh, these are just some examples of what I mean by the different heads. This is a spray head. It just or pop up is what you may have heard. It pops up and water starts shooting out. Uh, it doesn't really rotate at all. Uh, rotors, those are those ones that rotate back and forth, uh, put out a lot of water. Um, sometimes they'll get hit and then they'll start watering the road because they're out of alignment. And then these newer ones, multi-stream rotors. Uh, I really like these. I try to get people to switch to these uh, because they do a really good job of, of having a low precipitation rate. Um, therefore, we're not putting out too much water at one time. Uh, they all uh, also, you know, put out, you know, water uh, that isn't going to be blown away in the wind as well, uh, based upon the volume or the, the application rate uh, themselves. And they've also become very specialized that they can irrigate really tiny areas uh, really well, depending on, you know, what size nozzle you, you put on there. Um, conducting an irrigation audit. So once you have all your pipes and your valves and your heads all marked, you know, you can conduct an irrigation audit. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because that is in that handout that is outside, and I will also it's also available on our Turfgrass website. Uh, we could spend all day talking about this, but basically you just do an inspection of your system because most irrigation systems run overnight, and everybody's asleep, or hopefully they are, and then uh, you know we don't see what's happening during the nighttime. So this is something you would do in the day, and step by step. Everything that's on this slide here. It's in that handout in your hand or on the table out there as well. Uh, basically, you just set out cups, you do measurements, you make sure none of our heads are busted. If they are, you fix it before you run the audit. Uh, you fix your heads and get them aligned properly. Uh, you run the irrigation system. You measure how much water comes out using a ruler or using some type of graduated uh, straight-sided can. You can use a tuna fish can to use the ruler and just measure uh, how many inches fall uh, in a given amount of time. And then you do the math. And I've shown you how to do that uh, in that handout. So we'll kind of skip through this here uh, for the sake of time. There's also something called distribution uniformity. And that tells you if you're overwatering or underwatering in a certain area. As you can have, see here on the top, you have good distribution uniformity, uh, basically your head-to-head -head coverage. And we'll skip through this because uh, that's all in that handout here. And there are different recommendations based upon those three types of heads that I showed earlier. Uh, multi-stream rotors, sprays, and regular rotors as well. And the math uh, there is the same thing that you'll see in that handout in your hand. All right, so how much water should I put out at one time? We recommend that people uh, irrigate deeply and infrequently, that photo all the way on the right. You won't want to irrigate every day. Uh, I am definitely not a fan of the odd even uh, watering regime because that actually encourages people 
to irrigate 15 out of 30 days in a month. And we really, uh, during the summertime, maybe need to irrigate four times a month. You know, once a week, maybe twice a week at most, but not 15 out of 30 days. Uh, but when we irrigate, we want to put out a large amount of water um, because we're only doing it uh, very infrequently, maybe once or twice a week. Um, but the total volume that we recommend is about one inch of water. That irrigation, ir that irrigation auditing will help you determine how long or how to set up your system to apply one inch of water. Because again, you know, uh, tile system, it may take 20 minutes to put out a half an inch of water or, or 40 minutes to put out an inch of water. Nick's system, it may take his system 45 minutes to put out that inch of water. It's going to, again, depend property to property. I'm never going to tell Tyler and Nick to put out, you know, 10 minutes of water, but I will tell them both to put out a half an inch of water. I will tell you or anybody I talk to to put out a half an inch of water, and then you can utilize uh, that handout to determine how long to run your system for to get that half inch. If you did want to irrigate more uh, than twice a week, you can do an alternative. This gets a little bit more messy with the math, uh, but, you know, three... A uh, third of an inch of irrigation application. If you have a heavy loam or clay soil, you can do something called cycle and soak, where you basically run your irrigation system, even though you're only running it, running it maybe once or twice a week, you would just run it multiple times on the day that you water. So you maybe have it come on at, at midnight and then have it come in on again maybe at 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock. Let that water soak in if we have really slow draining soils. It's what we refer to as cycle and soak. And then we talked about conducting an irrigation audit. One final thing to think about as we close this evening is investing or implementing some type of rain sensor, upgrading to a smart controller, or utilizing soil moisture sensors. I brought some with me in case you want to look at one up close later on. I didn't bring a smart controller with me, but uh, there's plenty of pictures on this PowerPoint. So we'll start with the rain sensor. So these are rain sensors. Uh, they're fairly cheap. And truth be told, they kind of work that way as well. Uh, they work, depending on, in most cases, about one to three years' time. But after a while, all that's, all that's happening is these little cork discs will get wet. They'll expand. They'll send a signal to your controller to turn off. Uh, either during a rainstorm or right after a rainstorm, and it'll keep your system turned off until those cork discs dry out. Um, sometimes when that cork disc deteriorated over time, whether it's in direct sunlight or maybe it's, I've heard in some cases it gets really windy and dusty and chips away at the cork and reduces its sensitivity, uh, these can stop working after a while. Even though they are uh, fairly cheap, uh, the return on investment in terms of water savings uh, isn't as high as some other options. Now, something you may not be aware of is this is actually a state law uh, to have some type of irrigation shutoff device. And rain sensors are probably the number one uh, choice for most consumers and most companies to meet compliance with this law. This law is for all systems uh, installed after 2003. So if your system was installed after 2003, you, you need to have a rain sensor or some other type of shutoff device. I'm here, I was telling Tyler, I've been up here for a year. I'm kind of working with a lot of government officials and city administrators to try to tweak a lot of different rules or, or kind of, maybe not tweak is right, or maybe improve a lot of different uh, rules such as, you know, odd even watering days and also the use of rain sensors because we have newer technologies such as soil moisture sensors and, and smart controllers that save a lot more water and don't break down after one to three years. But you do have to have some type of uh, shut off device um, such as the rain sensor. Now, don't worry, there aren't, you know, a lot of police out there looking for violators. What really happens is usually a neighbor will call on a neighbor and call the utility company, and then even then, it may be some type of write-up or warning. Um, but I've never heard of, you know, I never see uh, where I used to live in, in Washington County in Arkansas, in the Washington County lockup, somebody in jail because their rain sensor, because their lawn is irrigated, so. Uh, but this is, this is a law uh, that we have here. And this isn't just exclusive to Minnesota. Uh, there are other states as well that utilize this. But soil moisture sensors are a lot more efficient. One, if you think about the word itself, soil moisture, 
that's actually where the water's being uptaken from. You know, we just talked about ET, where that water's being lost through the soil and, and taken up by the roots and through the plant. And so we want to make sure we have plenty of water in that soil uh, for the plant. And so they come in wireless forms. We just stick them in the ground. Um, and then it comes with a receiver that you plug into your existing system. Or it comes as wired forms. And, you know, even though this has a wire on it, I've installed many of these. And it very, requires very minimal digging, just a small little trenching shovel, and you're good to go. Um, it basically, this measures the volumetric water content or the amount of water and the soil, and those instructions of how to calibrate it, those instructions of how to, where to install it. Uh, they're, you know, fairly cheap in my opinion, about $120 to $160, depending on the model that you purchase and, and where you buy it from. Um, but again, it has this nice technology, wireless communication. Uh, you can stick it in close mode or tall mode turf. Uh, you know, this is a wired model. Uh, you can just wire it straight back to the valves that are already in your system. And then on the bottom, Right there kind of shows you how it's hooked up uh, to your existing timer. You don't have to have a Rainbird soil moisture sensor, and you, you don't have to have a Rainbird controller to plug in this Rainbird soil moisture sensor. They're fairly adaptable with most common controllers. And so on the top here, whenever it's wet, you know, whenever that red line is in the green on the top, it's not going to irrigate. Uh, that means you, as a homeowner, you don't have to go outside and remember, oh, it's going to rain tomorrow. I gotta go turn off my system. One thing, I, I'll just put a plug in here. I tell people just to keep their system turned off all year, and then only just go outside whenever you think it needs water, and then turn it off after that. But if, you know, if it's a big commercial property, or big, uh, you know, if you have other things on that, on that irrigation system, garden and stuff, uh, you can assign uh, your lawn to the soil moisture sensor. Uh, it'll do a good job of saving water. Uh, this is, again, people ask, where do I put one of these? And you, this picture is a little bit misleading. You don't need five of them, uh, but it, those are just the five different options it's showing there of where you could install it. Tells you where not to install it. Don't install it right next to the sidewalk or over a septic tank. Uh, this is kind of showing you how it works. Um, this controller is in the run position, um, but the controller is actually turned off because we have plenty of moisture. It says watering suspended. Uh, here's another example. Maybe able to see it better. It's in the run position. The dial is in the run or on position. Um, but that receiver, which is part of this soil moisture sensor, or the wireless communication, it has the controller turned off because we have plenty of water in the soil. So therefore, it's not going to irrigate and it's going to bypass. Uh, this is some photos from my research in Arkansas and looking at uh, the different systems. And you say, well, if we're not irrigating uh, because of the rain sensor or because of the soil moisture sensor, now, what does my grass look like if I haven't applied any water because we're, you know, foregoing it through the sensors? Well, can you tell a difference between any of these photos? Because some of these have gotten a lot of, because the one on the left has gotten, you know, water twice a week, and the other ones, you know, maybe haven't been watered at all that month. And they all look uh, fairly similar. I will kind of cheat a little and tell you this is all Bermuda grass, and it's fairly drought tolerant by itself. But even in Arkansas, we try to get people to stop watering. But this is true. Uh, also here in Minnesota and many of our grasses. Uh, this is a big table of data. Uh, I don't expect you to take time to read all of it. The one thing I want to point out is that we looked at on the left-hand column that same picture from before, you know, an irrigation system that had 34 irrigation events, that N equals 34, and then we had some soil moisture sensors at the bottom and the purple and the orange and rain sensors in the middle with the red and the blue. And we looked at how much water we saved on a typical home lawn over a summer period, over 17 weeks, June through September. And we saved uh, about 65 and 75,000 gallons of water by only irrigating maybe 13 or 10 times as opposed to irrigating 34 times, which is what a typical schedule would be without a sensor on it. So that's a lot of water. People ask, well, how much do these sensors cost? You know, does it pay for itself? The answer is yes. We sell a $147 or $181 return on investment in just one summer period. Um, again, you don't need to have a contractor come out and install this. The instructions are fairly simple. You can if you want. Um, but again, uh, it pays for itself. I would love to have an extra $150 to $200 uh, for maybe holiday travel, Black Friday shopping, or something like that at the end of the summertime that I can use later on in the year. Finally, smart controllers, I know we're out of time, uh, but smart controllers, 
I would recommend these if you have a really large property or if you are you know, a business owner and you have a large property um, with many zones and maybe your control is in like a place where you can't really see uh, you know, outside as you're moving the controls. Because the nice thing is uh, you can utilize your phone and they utilize Wi-Fi and you can, they basically make adjustments based upon that ET value, that weather, the climate, uh, the evapotranspiration that's going on and it'll reduce the runtime. On a day like today, it's like, all right, we need a, you know, water according to maybe 100% ET rather than a cloudy day, it'll maybe irrigate maybe 40% of ET because we know not a lot of water's been lost at all because of the cloudiness and low temperatures. Um, the cost for these are just going to be dependent on the number of zones. Those are a few different models. Uh, these are some other models as well that are out there and other options as well. Um, I'll kind of skip through this. We did a study looking at these, a little pilot study. I'll put a plug in. I'm doing this right now at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. If you are out at the Arboretum and you go to the picnic shelters on your way to the visitor center, you'll see me out there probably every day this summer, um, at least for the next few weeks. I'm in the middle of putting this project in. Um, and we're going to kind of showcase and demonstrate uh, the effectiveness of all of these different technologies and how they save water but also do not compromise the, the turf grass quality. But we utilized these uh, in a small little study on campus and we saw about 60 or 45 percent water reduction uh, with those smart controls or even on the top row there about 33 or 30 percent water reduction. With our soil moisture sensor uh, we saved about 83 to 82 percent and then that second row from the bottom where we just turned it on where we thought we needed to you know, 91 to 85 percent water reduction. So again, uh, just lots of different options to save water. One thing, though, I'll leave you with this: is that to keep in mind, we don't really need to irrigate. If you haven't, if you're thinking about installing an irrigation system, I encourage you to look at this graph very carefully, because on the x-axis, you know, we have our months from April, from spring to fall. The y-axis on the left, you know, our precipitation. This is from last year's data in the red and then the 30-year average from 1981 to 2010 of how much rain we get in each of those months. We just had a quarter of an inch of rain fall down in St. Paul in about 12 minutes time yesterday. I was outside mowing my research and I got soaking wet. <laughs> I was like, all right, we've got a quarter of an inch on the third day of June already. So, or whatever the date was. But uh, again, we get pretty wet here in the Twin Cities uh, on a historical basis. So that's why I encourage people to keep their system turned off. Um, again, if you think about that one inch a week and there's four weeks in a month, you know, June, July, August, during those hot times, and we're, we're kind of meeting that on a historical basis there uh, relative to where that, those four inches are. Uh, and finally, I talked about showing you a really neat picture. This is out at a research station. You can see in the background we have some green turf. Uh, there, that stuff, that, that turf there gets irrigated uh, on a weekly basis. I, I think it's on an odd even or maybe three day a week schedule. But this turf really close in the foreground, it doesn't get irrigated at all. This is Kentucky bluegrass. Uh, there's nothing special about it, not extra fertility or anything on the, on the other side. It's all, everything is the same about all these grasses except for the fertility, or sorry, except for the irrigation in the background grasses. This is after about three weeks of no rain. I don't know if you know, recall last August. Uh, from about July, the end of July to about right up until the state fair, it was hot. Not a lot of rain. But then we had about two and a half inches of rain fall over the state fair. Um, and in that time, this is what happened. We didn't apply any irrigation. It bounced back. It's as green as can be. You cannot even tell any difference between the other plots. So again, just something to think about. You know, do I need to water my lawn? Or do I just need to be patient and just tolerate a little bit of brown because it'll bounce back? So, uh, you can go online, find a lot of these products on the EPA website, look for the water sense label. Uh, I encourage you also to do that for your indoor fixtures as well. Toilets, sinks, faucets, any type of plumbing, uh, they may have some rebates there for you. So uh, there's a summary there. I'll let you read that uh, online. But I'll thank you for your time and close up. There's some references there as well. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to stick around. Thank you so much.